Good morning and thank you for dialing in today. And we have got a number of people registered, so we'll just wait another moment or two and allow everybody to join. So if you just want to get yourselves comfortable, we'll begin very shortly. Okay, well, I'm going to kick off. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar with Groundshaw, which will look at mining in the cities. Um, and in particular, we're going to look at Norwich during today's webinar. My name is Faye Stenning, and I'm the account manager here at InfoTrack. I'm delighted to be joined by Andy Crawshaw, who's the Senior Account Manager at Groundshaw, and he'll be talking you through this session today. Before we begin this webinar, and I hand over to Andy, I'd like to draw your attention, please, to the Q&A tab, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will be running a Q&A at the end of this session, so if you do have any questions that you might have, please type them in, along with your name, into the Q&A box. That way, if we run out of time or if your question re requires further clarification, we can extract your information and follow up with you directly after the webinar. OK, so I will now hand you over to Andy so that he can talk you through this morning's webinar. Thank you, Andy. That's great. Thank you, Faye. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. I hope everyone is well. As Faye said, if you've got any questions as we go through this, then um, please put them in the, the question box and I'll either get back to you at the end of the session or, or we can follow up with you afterwards. So this morning, we're going to focus on mining in Norwich. Just at the start, I'll give you a, a brief run through of the history of mining. Then we'll have a look at the risks that can be found in Norwich, along with a couple of cases of how it's been an issue in the past. We'll Look at the data that we use briefly and how that fits into some of the reports that you can get from us here at Groundshaw. So to start us off, what exactly is mining? So mining is the extraction of minerals or geological deposits from the earth. Exploitation of these deposits for raw material is based on the economic viability of investing in the equipment, investing in the labor and the energy required to extract uh, also required to refine and, and also transport the materials found at the mine to manufacturers who can use the material. If we consider something that almost everybody owns, such as a smartphone, it will contain an abundance of minerals, including some of the ones that you can see on your screen. So ones we know like gold and tin and carbon and iron, but also things that you might not realise like nickel or chrome or uh, aluminium that, that's in there as well. All of these minerals and elements have to be mined for the production of a smartphone. It's also pertinent co to consider simply the demands for mining by the mining industry itself. For example, there's a demand for coal to power the foundries that are producing steel. The steel is required to make tools in order to mine the coal and for the headgear to raise the coal to the surface. The coal is then needed to power pumping engines and steam locomotives, allowing miners to go deeper in both coal and metal mines. Bricks are also needed to build the mine buildings and the foundries themselves. Therefore, stone mining for elements such as clay, shale, limestone and chalk are needed and they're mined in brick fields. Crucibles are then needed to smelt steel. These are made from fire clay, often found interbedded between coal seams. And this cycle is never ending. And it does just give you an idea of how important the minerals are for the process itself, as well as for the end product. Taking you through some of the types of mining, one method of extraction is drift mining. This is where mineral deposits become exposed within a hillside or a valley. These would be extracted by hand and later by machinery directly into the hillside until the mineral was depleted, the working became unstable and collapsed, or the mine became unworkable due to being flooded, for example. We have chalk wells. Uh, the earliest examples of chalk mines are very far removed from modern day methods of extraction. Initially, they are likely to have begun as chalk well excavations, consisting of a narrow shaft sunk through the overlying ground onto the chalk bed. From this, a cluster of galleries were dug out, leaving a beehive-shaped excavation below ground. And as miners would have been using simple tools and bare hands, these workings are normally found at shallow depths, working the chalk closest to the surface. Bell pit mining is another early form of mining that works deposits found close to the surface. These may have been in order of around 15 metres deep, 
restricted to the primitive techniques available to the miners in terms of controlling the stability of the feature and the risk of inundation. This involves the sinking of a narrow shaft to access the deposit before working the mineral out by hand, leaving a bell-shaped excavation beneath the surface. The mineral was then winched to the surface via a bucket, much like we see from wells uh, for water. These are always highly unstable workings. So as a pit became unstable, the miners would return to the surface and sink another shaft adjacent to the previous one in a hope to come down on the same mineral again. And these workings lie largely unrecorded, except on old paper geological mapping and aerial imagery and LIDAR. In these instances, clusters of these shafts can be identified. And then we'll have a, we have a look at open cast mining. This is sometimes referred to as open pit or open cut mining. And this is where minerals are found in commercially favorable quantities near the surface. So what we'd see here is the removal of a thin layer of overburden, which exposes the economically viable mineral without the need for tunneling deep underground. These are very often seen today as huge surface excavations put down into the ground by a series of ventures. And if we move on to look at Norwich specifically and, and the types of geology that underlie the surface in, in Norwich, but also the kinds of risks that come from them. And this slide just gives some clarity on the different types of stone mining that have happened in Norwich. So we've got chalk, clay, flint, limestone, sand, and also gravel and sandstone. And we can see evidence that mining in Norfolk um, Norfolk's county town of Norwich is suggested to date back as early as the 12th century. However, across the county, there is clear evidence of mineral extraction dating back over 5,000 years. Chalk plays a key role in agriculture and is commonly used for liming, whereby a mixture of minerals, naturally high in calcium and magnesium, are used to help fertilize the ground and balance the pH of the soil. It was also used within the construction industry and the growing expansion of the city meant the demand was high, coupled with the expansion of farming to support the city and its surroundings. Consequently, being a key industry in Norwich and the surrounding areas for generations, the demand for chalk boomed and the number of mining operations in the city uh, multiplied rapidly. Flint was also mined sporadically throughout the city, although less extensively than at the world famous prehistoric mines 40 miles away near Thetford Forest, known as Grimes Graves, they include over 500 mine shafts and produce quality flint to be used as hand tools, hand axes, scrapers and microliths, which were a Neolithic person's Swiss army knife. Then we fast forward a few thousand years and the use of chalk in Norwich's buildings is very evident just by walking the city streets. It's clear how important this sedimentary carbonate rock really is, as it helps make up some beautifully historic buildings throughout the city. The earliest example of chalk mines are very far removed from modern day methods of extraction. Initially, they are likely to have begun as chalk well excavations, consisting of a narrow shaft sunk through the overlying ground onto the chalk bed. From this, a cluster of galleries were dug out, leaving a beehive shaped excavation below the ground. And as miners would have been using simple tools and bare hands, these workings are normally found at shallow depths. And as I mentioned previously, they're working the chalk closest to the surface. So here at Groundshaw, we recently produced a white paper, which is available to download from our website at groundshaw.com. And it's revealed the potential scale of the risks in Norwich. There are in excess of 34,000 properties covering 37% of the Norwich area, which could be affected by future subsidence from past non-coal mining activity. When an area has been subject to intensive redevelopment and mass urbanization, any evidence of former mining activity is likely to have been lost, especially if it has been built over. This makes it harder for people to connect with this history and therefore the potential risks it may pose. And if we think of how many developments have taken place on top of these workings without prior due diligence, and then we have the increase in climate change, which means that more soluble soil and rocks like chalk and limestone may be more prone to collapse as both locally heavy rainfall 
or drought-related subsidence from clays and gravels could accelerate this risk. And as you can see there, there's uh, 985 Brit pit records in Norwich, 78 natural cavities, and also 19 mining cavities in the city. And just having a look at how these have affected the area in the past, there's a, a couple of case studies that I just want to go through with you. So if you look at Earlham Road on the 3rd of March, 1988, we've all seen this picture of the bus in the sinkhole before, but this is where a medieval chalk mine collapsed. It was the number 26 bus, which was passing at the time, and it, it fell into this collapsed mine. And initially, this was a mine that was bricklined. Uh, the tunnels were left unsupported uh, the further that they actually went into the ground. And you can see the, the little red diamonds there of where we've seen mine collapses in the past. It is possible that the collapse was caused by changes in the water content of the chalk. This may have been caused by things like heavy rainfall, damaged water infrastructure, or a host of other contributing factors. The flint and chalk from this mine was likely used in the construction of some churches in the city. It was almost certainly provided for some of the mass stone used for the city wall. The mine was rediscovered in 1823 and was then opened to the public. Now, in recent years, the term sinkhole is one that has become ever more common in our media headlines. An important attributing factor to the occurrence of these sinkholes is the underlying geological bedrock. It relies almost entirely on dissolvable minerals being present for a void to be created and a sinkhole to be formed. Limestone is one of these minerals. We've seen a number of sinkholes reported in the last 12 months, and after thorough investigation from the respective regional water companies, many have been associated with damaged water infrastructure. So as pipelines deteriorate and age, leaks can develop and ultimately lead to material surrounding the pipes being washed away. In cases where the local geology contains dissolution of limestone or other soluble minerals, it can simply fall into the solution. This creates a void around the leaking pipe and in turn means the surface of the ground is no longer supported. Pressure and heavy loads upon the surface can lead to a hole opening up revealing the extent of the void beneath, and thus a sinkhole appears in the news that we, we see quite a lot, especially during heavy rainfall. It should be noted that whilst damaged infrastructure does play a part in sinkhole development, there are natural causes too. For example, water passing through fissures into the soluble material following heavy rainfall, or as we are seeing more frequently with the effects of global climate change, rising sea, sea levels. Equally, over long periods of time, Groundwater flowing through the subsurface can dissolve the carbonate bedrocks, creating voids. And these voids then allow groundwater to flow at a greater, more accelerated rate, this in itself making the water more erosive. These factors allow soil above the bedrock to collapse into the void, which in time continues to erode from the inside, eventually migrating to the surface, creating open holes. A point to always consider is how historic mining features can cause similar events. The collapse of mine workings do often get branded in the media as a sinkhole. However, some schools of thought consider sinkholes to be merely naturally occurring phenomena. Such, and as such, mine workings may sit outside of this definition. However, what is interesting is when you have sinkholes recorded in areas where there are historic mine workings for the extraction of chalk. And if we look at this recent sinkhole uh, in Norwich that happened on the 30th of July of 2021, it was a small hole that was spotted on the site of a previously investigated and treated sinkhole from 2018, where a woman's car got trapped after her tire dropped into the void. The cause of the original collapse was con considered to be down to a broken cast iron pipe, much like we've just discussed. But what's interesting is when you overlay Ground Shore's historic mining data onto modern day ordnance survey mapping, you can see the original site of the 2018 sink sinkhole which is depicted here with the red diamond. And this is the same location of the collapse on the 30th of July last year. Close to the south, there are some recorded chalk mining workings of an unknown depth. And these are like likely to uh, date back to the 13th century. And if we connect these to the surface, there are two recorded mine shafts. And our experience 
of other local examples tells us that there is likely more going on here than the historic sources depict. But due to the independent and unsystematic manner of the local mining operations, records are very poor and incomplete. Norwich has a history of sinkholes and of collapses caused by ancient, sporadic and mostly unrecorded chalk mining activity. In the case of this sinkhole, the experts investigated and attributed it to damaged infrastructure, but so many around the city of Norwich have had a mining related cause. It just highlights that something we are often faced with when talking to people about mining risk, there is a common misconception that cities are not affected by mining, that it is a rural problem, but that's just simply not the case. Whether it be naturally occurring, a broken pipe or collapsed mine working, these events can hold equal devastation for a homeowner. And then if we take particular focus on the recorded workings around Merton Road in Norwich, we begin to see the sort of effects antiquated chalk workings can have on ground stability and property. Evidence of mineral extraction here is clearly from the uh, is pretty clear from early Auden survey mapping, which not only shows a bold title of stone hills across the area in question, some might argue suggested in itself, but also shows the presence of an initially small mile pit and associated lime kiln. Over time, the quarry rapidly expands in terms of size, and additional lime kilns are also recorded suggesting an increase in production and growth of the operation. Available mining records for the area show cases of subsidence, as well as a maze of underground workings, believed to possibly emanate from the faces of the recorded quarry. So now that I've um, set the scene a little, I thought I'd cover off a little about some of the sources we use on a day-to-day -day basis, starting with the mining records and also touching on the Ordnance Survey mapping and finishing with a few additional sources. So prior to the 19th century, coal mining remained largely unrecorded. Then in 1840, the first mining records office was established in London. It wasn't until 1872 that a legal act came into action, making it a legal requirement to deposit an abandonment plan within three months from the date of abandonment. It was a requirement to produce a plan from 1850, but no requirement to actually deposit that plan. The key point to note here was that all that was required to be shown on these plans was the boundary of a mine working up to the time of abandonment. There was no requirement for orientation within the surface, depth or section information to be shown. Abandonment plans were used to help the and, and ensure the safety of miners. And then in around 1883, the mining records office was transferred to the home office, no doubt along with the collection of the plans. Then in 1923 to 1931, there were two mining accidents following which there was a call for plans to be deposited and which was widely responded to. This was quite significant as it now included plans which identified the underground working. In 1939, all the plans were transferred to Buxton from London. Then after the Second World War in 1950, coal plans were segregated from plans of other minerals and split into regional areas to allow the plans to be more easily accessible. The collection of coal plans were then reunited in 1992, the British coal site near Burton-on-Trent, and were then inherited by the Coal Authority on privatisation of the coal industry in 1994 to be finally transferred to the Coal Authority headquarters at Mansfield. So the reason why I've chosen to provide this part of history of the plans is simply that plans were sometimes never produced, not deposited, lost in transit, or have become unreadable. They've become torn, written all over, tea spilt on them. We've even come across ones with bloodstains on them. And it tells us that records that we consider are quite incomplete. And the reason that the plans were produced is not necessarily clear on the plans deposited. For example, plans can show exaggerated reserves drawn to raise interest in selling shares. The plans may only show a fraction of the mine's extent, identifying only those areas which the mine was looking to exploit. All this provides the reason why you should have an experienced, competent coal mining assessment undertaken and also look at the possibility of other coal, other mining as well, which isn't necessarily coal. It's integral to the rational and the provision of the CON29M that we see today and also why we're seeing more and more non-coal mining reports available on the market.
So here at Ground Show, we acquired Mining Searches UK in January of 2020. And with that came their team of um, just short of 10 mining search specialists. And they've also got three or four geologists who actually work in the office down in Cornwall as well. Mining Search in the UK have been interpreting and investigating mining since 1978. As you can see here, this is a map of uh, Liverston. This is a mine in Yorkshire. And at this mine, they actually excavate ironstone. These were originally all paper maps, but as you can see, we've now digitized them so that they can come through our system. So within our reports as well, we also have the National Mining and Stability Model. This is a tool that Groundshore has developed and used for many years within our mining and ground stability reports. The model has been developed and refined over 40 years of reporting and investigating mining related risk. The model now includes even more proprietary data and third party data just to ensure a comprehensive assessment is provided for each individual property. This combined with our expert knowledge, investigation reports and additional information from thousands of transactions allows us to accurately assess the mining and stability risk posed to each individual property. When each report is ordered, it goes through the national mining and stability model. This is just to determine the risk to a property and where risks are identified a specialist mining consultant will review all of the data available for the property and surrounding area just to determine if there is a, an actual risk to that property itself. In many instances, we'll be able to issue a past report. And while some may not see the importance of a mining search if it has passed, you have that peace of mind that the report has been fully interpreted, which is where the value lies, and knowing that your client's property is not affected. And then just to quickly take you through the reports that we offer here at Groundshore. We have our GeoRisk report, which is the definitive report covering non-coal mining, recorded ground movement from satellite monitoring, and natural ground stability hazards, including coastal erosion. And we also look into detail on any past sinkhole risks that have happened uh, in any given area. So every media report of a sinkhole that's happened since 2014 we will record them in these reports. This is currently the only standalone non-coal report available. But then we also have our Geo Risk, uh, Geo Risk Plus report. This is the most comprehensive report which covers all types of mining. And as such, we are the only provider of all three core mining types. So in this, you have everything that's in the Geo Risk report, but it also has uh, an official CON29M and it also has a Cheshire Brine report as well, if it's in one of the, uh, the, the Cheshire Brine compensation districts. And obviously, if it's in uh, a coal mining area, it will include the full mining report as well. And then we have our uh, Vista report, which if you're looking for the complete all-in-one residential report, then this is the one for you. So not only does it have all that mining that's in the GeoRisk Plus report, it also looks at contaminated land, uh, infrastructure, so any sort of energy infrastructure that's going on in the area, such as windmills, um, uh, wind farms, solar farms, any gas or oil extraction. It will cover planning applications as well, so looking at small and large applications and house extensions. And then in line with the Law Society, it looks at flooding, other mining, and um, it also looks at uh, transportation. So HS2, uh, it looks at Crossrail 1 and 2 in London. It looks at the underground, not just in um, London, but also Liverpool, Glasgow and Newcastle. So it's the full all-in-one environmental report for you. And you can see there that everything that, from a non-course perspective, what the Avista covers, the same as our GeoRisk and GeoRisk Plus reports. And that's everything from me today. Thank you very much for your time. I'll now pass you back over to Faith. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, Andy. Um, we don't have any questions at the moment, but if you do have any that you wanted to submit, please pop them in the Q&A tab um, and we'll get to them. Um, but in the meantime, I would like to say a big thank you to Groundshore and in particular to Andy for his time today. And I do hope that you've all found this session very informative. If you do have any questions at all about anything you've learned today or questions in relation to ordering Groundshore reports through the InfoTrack platform, then you can either contact us using the details on your screen or you can reach out to your account manager 
who will be able to assist you. Um, I do want to let you know that today's session is being recorded and we will send you a copy so that you can refer back to Andy's notes. Um, I'm just looking, we still haven't had any questions in. So Andy, I think you must have carried out such a full webinar. You've answered any questions that may have arisen to anybody's minds in particular. So all that's left to say now is thank you ever so much indeed for attending this morning's webinar to those that have attended. Um, thank you to Andy and to Groundshaw for all of the information and enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you very much indeed.